Hello, my name is Jenna Middlemeyer. I'm from the Institute of Educational Technology at the Open University in the UK. And I'm recording this presentation for the Learning Analytics Community Exchange Project as part of the resources they are making available for the 2015 Learning Analytics Summer Institute. Today I'm going to be telling you about a study that we conducted in a UK business school with a diverse module of mostly international students. These types of highly diverse modules are becoming increasingly more prevalent, particularly as the number of international students continues to rise worldwide. In the UK in 2013, for instance, there were over 425,000 international students registered. And although you can find international students in any discipline, they tend to be clustered around certain disciplines. For instance, in the UK, a full 38% of registered business students are international. And this fundamentally changes the dynamics within a classroom. Now, international students bring a host of benefits to their universities, not just economically, although that's what you, you tend to see more often in the news, but also in their potential to help foster cross-cultural communication and exchanging of ideas between students from various cultures. Now, that's not to say that the social transition has been easy for international students. In fact, in the UK, it's been noted that there is a culture of passive xenophobia towards international students from host national students. It's also well documented that many international students face difficulties in making connections with host national peers, and that their friendship circles tend to be homogenous, comprised of mostly students from the same country, culture, or religion. And this diminishes that potential for cross-cultural collaboration and exchange. One way of encouraging cross-cultural collaboration in the classroom is through the use of group work, as group work in a way forces students to work with one another when perhaps they wouldn't have otherwise had a reason to communicate. In fact, group work has been shown to foster cross-cultural communication and, and also to increase social networks between diverse groups of students in the classroom over time. Now, incorporating cross-cultural group work into the classroom has challenges particularly as many students prefer to work with group members from a similar cultural background. And the research has highlighted that this could be for a variety of reasons, such as language issues or perception of asymmetrical workload. But the research on this topic tends to look at students' perceptions or reflections of the issues, such as through surveys or interviews. And very little research has analyzed actual student behaviors in group work to determine how they might differ, such as by using learning analytics methods. An alternative explanation could be that things like culture or personality traits influences the ways that students contribute to group work, which leads to a mismatch in expectations between diverse group members. So that's where this research positions itself. We had two primary research questions. We wanted to know firstly, in what ways culture and personality traits influence the ways that students contribute to group work. And secondly, whether we could predict students' group work contributions uh, by their culture and personality traits. This research was conducted in a master's level module at a UK business school. Altogether, we had 58 participants from 13 countries. And the study took place in a computer lab environment. Um, however, the computer lab was part of the regular module schedule, so it was a familiar environment to students. And in the lab, we split students into small groups of three to five participants, and the participants were seated around the lab so that they did not sit adjacent to any of their group members. Next, we asked them to role play. Students were asked to pretend that they were members of an international consultant agency tasked with a problem by one of their clients. And we asked them to pretend that they were working from their own home countries with experts from around the world using only an online chat as their sole means of communication. And in this sense, the activity really mimicked a real world task that they might be asked to participate in during their business careers. The problem that we asked students to solve was based on a Harvard Business School case study. And in this case study, uh, there was a tire company that was facing high worker, worker turnover rates. Uh, the case study was about 15 pages long, but we divide that up so that each group member received only a few pages of information. Um, each group member received a unique set of information in that sense, and we let students know this so that uh, it could foster communication based on the information that each student received. Now, much of the case study information was text-based, like what you see on the screen now. 
However, some of it was also raw data, like so. Uh, we gave participants about 15 minutes of reading time. Again, this was just a few pages of information. And then we asked them to log into an online chat system through their virtual learning environment. At this point, students were given about 45 minutes to discuss in the online chat uh, to determine one best solution that they would provide for the problem. In order to analyze culture and personality, we adopted two quantitative scales in this research. For culture, we retained information about students' nation of origin and converted it to Hofstede's cultural dimensions. Hofstede argues that culture can be represented by a set of six dimensions, which are shown on the screen here. In this framework, each individual country is given a unique score in each dimension, based on where their broader culture ranks on the scale. The scales measure things like the strength of hierarchies in a country, individual versus group focus, or ego versus relationship orientation. However, we recognized that Hofstede's framework is flawed. And indeed, I, I think it would be impossible to measure culture quantitatively without some inherent flaws. Uh, one of the, the larger criticisms of Hofstede's framework is that it focuses on very macro-level influences, while at the same time perhaps ignoring the more micro-level influences on individual behavior. So for this reason, we also wanted to look at personality. To measure personality, we adopted the Big Five personality dimensions, which is a commonly used scale to measure personality in psychology and educational psychology. This measurement highlights five major traits of individual personality, extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, emotional stability, and openness to experience. These scales are typically captured by a personality survey. And in this study, we used the 10 item personality inventory, which is a short 10 question survey that measures big five personality dimensions. In this study, we retained various informational data pieces about students, such as their nationality, which we converted to Hofstede's cultural dimension scales, the results of their 10-item personality inventory, which measured their personality traits, as well as students' module grades. And we used this data to analyze behavioral traces of students in the chat, such as the number of posts each student made or the summed word count that was submitted. Finally, we did a bit of textual analysis, and we manually coded when students made an explicit reference to information they were given as part of the case study materials. While the 10-item personality inventory has been found to be a reliable method of obtaining Big Five personality dimensions in a wide variety of previous studies, we unfortunately found in our case that the Kronbach alphas of three of the five scales were too low to be considered reliable. And one explanation for this could be that most participants were non-native English speakers and perhaps internal translation errors skewed their answers to certain questions. Nevertheless, two of the scales did demonstrate reasonable reliability, extroversion, and openness to experience. So for analysis, therefore, uh, only these two scales were used. So what did we find? We started with bivariate analysis to determine some simple correlations. We look specifically at whether our behavioral traces, including number of posts, the summed word count submitted, and the number of case information references, correlated with students' cultural dimensions, personality traits, or module grades. In our case, culture in particular significantly and strongly correlated with behavioral traces, especially the number of posts and the summed word count submitted. However, surprisingly, neither personality traits nor students' grades correlated. Next, we conducted stepwise regression analysis to determine the predictive power of culture and personality traits. In this analysis, we used three individual dependent variables, which were our behavioral traces, uh, so the number of posts, the summed word count submitted, and the number of case information references. Our independent variables were, again, students' Hofstede's dimensions, their cultural traits, personality traits, and their module grades. For the number of posts made, our regression analysis demonstrated that a full 30.3% of the variation between students could be explained by two cultural traits, Hofstede's uncertainty avoidance and individualism. Um, in the case of uncertainty avoidance, this tells us that students from cultures that feel less comfortable with unstructured environments are predicted to post more. 
And this makes sense in a way as students uh, may feel more likely to ask questions or clarify expectations. Here are some example posts from a student from China, which is the country in our study that feels least comfortable with uncertain environments. When the chat starts, the student logs in and immediately says, hi, does anyone know what is happening here? Later in the chat, the student asks for clarifications of the assignment. And finally, the student posts apologies along the way for making typing errors. You can sense from this that the student feels unsure or even unconfident in the chat and that she seeks affirmation and reassurance from her peers. The second predictor for number of posts was students from more individualistic or I-centered cultures. And this seems logical as students from more individualistic cultures may feel more comfortable with free expression of ideas or opinions. Here's a student from the UK, the most individualistic country in our study. This student is the first to offer an opinion in the chat. He says, if morale is low, it might be because they are hiring external people rather than focusing on the staff they already have. When another student asks for suggestions for a solution, the student is again the first to respond and says, more training for existing, existing foremen so they can work better and be promoted more. Finally, when another student makes a different suggestion, this student affirms, yes, that fits with my idea. In this case, you can really sense more confidence and ease with expressing ideas, particularly compared to the previous student. Next, we looked at the summed word count submitted. We did this because some students had different styles of communicating in the chat. Some students posted many short messages, while others took time to construct longer paragraphs. In this case, the analysis highlighted that 25.5% of the variation between students could again be explained by two cultural traits, Hofstadter's masculinity and individualism. In addition to individualism, which was previously discussed, this shows us that more feminine cultures, those that are more relationship oriented and focused on conflict resolution, are more apt to submit more overall words. Again, this seems to make sense as students were working to solve a problem and students from cultures that value conflict resolution may have felt more in their element. Here's a student from Denmark, our most feminine country in this study. This student is a natural leader in the group, pushing forward the problem solving. When his group members start offering too many suggestions, he reminds them that they must find only one solution. When he doesn't understand someone's comment, he seeks clarifications by asking things like, can you be a, a bit more specific about the special information you were given? Or that's sarcasm, yeah? And when the group gets to the end of the assignment time and still haven't found a solution, he is the one to rally everyone together to finish the task by saying, all right, guys, we have to find a solution. Everyone come with your suggestions and we'll look at them. Finally, we looked at the number of references students made to the case study information text they were given. In this case, the analysis shows that only 5.9% of the variation between students can be explained by just one cultural trait. Hofstede's individualism. However, this lower percentage combined with fewer predictive traits and fewer correlations with our informational data about students seems to beg the question of whether, whether the differences between diverse students' contributions are cosmetic or more about quantity over quality. However, a more in-depth textual analysis would be necessary to confirm this. So, looking back at our original research questions, what did we actually discover? Firstly, we wanted to determine how culture and personality traits influence the ways students contribute to group work. In this case, we found that culture is an important influence on student behavior, which was demonstrated by both bivariate analysis and regression analysis. However, personality did not seem to be as strong of an influence. However, this could perhaps be due to the low reliability of some of the scales we used. We'd like to repeat the study with a more robust measurement of personality to confirm this. Interestingly, student grades or their achievement in the, in the module also did not appear to be a significant influence on their behaviors in the chat. Thus, this highlights that perhaps more macro level influences of culture may be more important influences than other micro-level influences, such as personality or academic achievement. Our second research question looked at the predictive power of culture and personality traits. 
In the case of culture, we can say yes, that cultural traits, at least in this study, can in fact predict the quantity of student contributions in group work. However, personality again was not demonstrated as a predictor, and neither was student achievement. In addition, more research is needed to see if culture influences the quality of students' contribution to group work. The next step in this research is to highlight evidence-based interventions that can help drive more equal participation in group work across cultures. In the meantime, however, I do feel that there are some practical implications or tips for educators and researchers based on what we know so far. First, additional scaffolding may be helpful at the start of projects to help inform students how culture influences their own and others' group contributions. Too often we give students instructions about the project or the assignment, but not necessarily training about how to work effectively with one another. And this is unfortunate considering that the classroom is often the first time that students have the opportunity to work closely with those from other cultures. This could be as simple as explaining Hofstede's dimensions and giving students tools to understand that cultures in general can vary along certain lines. As culture correlates with the amount of contributions, role assignments may also encourage more equal contributions, as has been demonstrated in previous research. By giving students roles with explicit instructions for how they should contribute to the group, students from more reserved cultures may feel more comfortable contributing more, and vice versa. Finally, I feel this has implications for the way that we look at assessment of group work. It certainly lends to the argument that students should be assessed by quality rather than quantity of contribution, as deeply ingrained factors like culture may be influencing the quantity of participation in ways that are perhaps not immediately apparent. Now altogether, this research is relatively preliminary and certainly will require future studies to confirm and build upon these findings. However, if there's one key takeaway from what we've learned so far, it's that these results further validate the notion that students' cultural and diverse backgrounds are important influences on their measurable behaviors in group work, and this should be a consideration for both researchers and educators alike. If you're interested in learning more about the research and resources I've mentioned in this presentation, my references are listed here. You can pause the video to review them more easily. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Should you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to post a comment to this video or contact me at the email address listed on the screen. You can also find me on Twitter. If you'd like to hear more about the Learning Analytics Community Exchange, you can visit their webpage at laceproject.eu. Thanks again for watching, and I hope you've enjoyed learning about our study.